right. Um, hi, everyone. This is Abera Okoye, and we are going to go ahead and get started. I see that we don't have any questions um, prior to the call, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, tonight, we're going to be covering a very important topic, um, how to handle the IRS and how to deal with the IRS and IRS audits and audit prevention and all that. In addition, we're also going to be talking about the benefits of um, investing in commercial real estate. And this evening, we have um, Steve Treatment, who's going to be joining me um, on the call. So hello, Steve. Are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here, Barry. Okay, great. And can you see my screen okay? Um, yeah, I can see it just fine. Okay. All right, so we will go ahead and get started. As we go through, just um, to give you guys an agenda for this evening, I will present for about 15, 20 minutes. And I'm going to have Steve present for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we will open up the line for any questions that anybody has. Um, also, feel free to type in your questions in the chat box if you have any questions um, as we go along. All right, um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, I am the Wealth Building CPA and the founder of WealthBuildingCPA.com. I own um, real estate investments in five states across the eastern coast. <laughs> I've been investing in real estate for about 11 years and a CPA for 19 years. So I've helped over 5,000 people prepare their taxes online and offline. And what is the WBCPA advantage? What, what unique things do we bring to the table to real estate investors? Um, being in the industry for so many years, I'm very familiar with money-saving strategies, which I love to implement all of the time. So being a CPA and being a real estate investor is a great combination because I know what an investor needs um, in order to, one, save on their taxes, two, to protect their assets, three, to build their wealth. And with this combination, it's always a great pleasure for me to empower, empower you um, and empower your financial life. And this means that you can trust us as one of your team members so you can spend more time and money in your business. And um, this evening, um, we have a special guest, Steve Streetman. Steve is an experienced real estate investor. He's an equity marketing specialist. He's a realtor. He's an instructor and a speaker on commercial real estate investment. And he's a leader of the commercial team and commercial mastermind group at the Real Estate Investors of Maryland. And he's a professional risk analyst and former rocket scientist. Well, Steve, I feel humbled having you on the call this evening. Well, thanks, Barry. I really appreciate you having me. Um, I'm excited to talk about commercial real estate investing because this is just a, an awesome time to be looking at commercial cash flowing real estate. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to talking about that with your, with your group here. Definitely. All right, so we will go ahead and um, dig in. What is the wealth building plan? Everything that we talk about at the Wealth Building CPA starts with a recognition that there is a wealth building plan, that there's a wealth building program that every investor needs to follow. So right here on the screen, you can see that we have eight stages in the wealth building program. And the first stage is to have a financial needs analysis done. You know, where are you today? Where are your finances today? And where do you need to go? And then the other thing that we look at is tax planning and preparation. Um, it's more than just preparing your taxes and meeting the April 15th deadline. But we also look at tax planning. What can we do to save you on taxes, um, not to expose you to an IRS audit, to make sure that you're not having any missed deductions or any overlooked um, elections that you need to make on your tax return. And then we also look at entity structuring, where we take a look at your real estate strategy and make sure that the entity structure that you form meets your real estate strategy. Um, usually when we look at entity structuring, we look at three things. Um, the first thing that we look at is ease of compliance. How easy is it to structure this entity? The second thing that we look at is asset protection. How well 
can we have uh, assets protected? And then the third thing that we look at is tax reduction. How will this entity structure um, save you on taxes? We can also do um, the business registration. You know, actually, once we decide on the entity structure, we will set up the business, get the EIN number, draft the operating agreement, you know, help you with bookkeeping, make sure that the bank accounts are set up. So pretty much you're in compliance. And then after that, we do the business analysis meetings. In the business analysis meetings, we're taking a strategic look at the business to see where you need to be um, in the business. You know, we're taking a look at your strategy, your marketing, your costs, um, the groups that you're part of, who you have as a coach, your mentor, you know, the real estate strategy that you've chosen, whether or not it meets, um, you know, where you are financially, where you are in your career, or where you are in your family. And then the next thing we look at is investment property purchasing. You know, depending on what real estate strategy that you're choosing to focus on, we will talk about finding the property, farming the property, and funding the property. And tonight we're going to be focusing on commercial real estate under stage six. And then we also look at retirement planning, um, how best to utilize the assets that you have so that, one, you can retire early, Two, you can retire comfortably. And we, you know, in, on the retirement plan, we take a look at self-directed IRAs and solo 401k. And then the final stage, which is kind of like at the end of the year, we do year-end tax plan. In November, December, I tell my clients that um, April 15th is a tax filing deadline, but December um, 31st is a tax savings deadline. So whatever you don't implement by year-end, um, pretty much is late. So year in tax plan is where we take a look at your financial picture, what has happened during the year, and see how we can save on taxes before the year runs. All right, so I have everybody on mute mode um, now so that it's just Steve and I because we're getting some interference on the call. Um, like I said, the Wealth Building Program is a 12-month training program. So we go through 12 months. We're not just a CPA firm that's only open during tax season. We're open year-round. And we work with our clients. Each month we have something going on. You know, just to give you a quick rundown, January through April we're filing taxes. May, June we're doing business meetings. Um, July, August we're doing retirement planning. And then August through October, we go back to tax preparation for our clients that filed extensions. And then November, December, we're looking at year-end tax planning. And then throughout the year, we're always doing entity structuring for um, clients that need that service. So um, the Ultimate Wealth Building Plan focuses on specific elements of the wealth building system. And the goal is, you know, after you're with us for 12 months, you should be up and running, and one, saving on taxes, two, protecting your assets, and three, building your wealth. Um, this evening, we're going to be focusing on stage two, tax planning and preparation. Um, during this stage, usually we take a look at the last three years of tax returns. We review it for accuracy, for inconsistency, any audit flags, any overlooked deductions. Um, an important part of reduction planning is not just um, filing the returns right or getting a huge rate on it, but it's also making sure that you're not um, wasting deductions and making certain elections to, to make sure that you're taking advantage of unused deductions in future years. And, you know, during this stage, if you need to, we also prepare your individual and business tax returns for the current year. Um, specifically tonight on the tax planning and preparation, we are going to be covering um, IRS audits. Um, approximately 1.5% of all taxpayers are audited every year. So that's a very small number. But I know that whenever people think about the IRS, um, a lot of people get scared. A lot of people are worried. They never want to be audited. They never, because the IRS has created this fear in the minds of people. Um, and the reason why we're doing this call tonight is because we're all wealth builders. We're here to create wealth. And, you know, like they said, it's good to know your enemy. And so for those of us that see the IRS as an enemy, the goal tonight is to educate you so that you're aware of what the IRS taxes are, what their audit areas are, 
one, so that you can avoid them, and two, even if you did get to the point where you were audited by the IRS, you were well prepared to deal with an IRS audit and not just throw up your hands, you know, in fear and accept whatever it is that the IRS um, submits to you as an adjustment. So one of the things that we're going to be looking at, what are the high risk tax audit areas, what are the things that the IRS looks at or what things could potentially trigger an audit um, in the IRS. If you have high income, you know, of course, you've heard the saying that if you're making over $250,000 that, you know, the IRS is looking closely because they know that the higher the income, the more the propensity to try to find ways to, um, you know, hide the income or pay less taxes than is due. So if you have high income, you definitely want to make sure that you're preparing your tax returns right. If you have large amounts of itemized deductions, so if you file a Schedule A, and typically people that file Schedule A's are those that own a home, so you have home mortgage interest and taxes. If you have a large amount of charitable contributions, if you have unreimbursed employee business expenses. And this is very important because, you know, I typically see a lot of people who want to take a deduction for mileage to their job or you took an ed a course that your employer did not reimburse. And because of that, you want to itemize it on the Schedule A. Well, if you have a high amount of miscellaneous deductions, that could trigger an IRS audit. So you do want to be aware of that. If you have unreported amounts of taxable income, so usually, um, if you didn't know this, whatever tax document that you receive, the IRS has a copy of it. So if you have a W-2, the IRS has a copy of it. If you receive a 1099 interest, the IRS has a copy of it. If you receive a 1099 miscellaneous, the IRS has a copy of it. And so one of the things that they look at is if you have unreported taxable income, meaning when they compare the income that you reported on the tax return to what was actually submitted under your name or the name of your business, and you have unreported amounts, that can trigger an audit. So that's something that you definitely want to watch out for. If you're a rental property owner, this is very important because I know I'm talking to a lot of real estate investors. If you own rental property, you are in a high risk of audit, especially if you have a regular job, meaning that you have a W-2. Um, and the reason is because um, from 2005 to 2008, the IRS um, conducted a study and found out that there were a lot of people who said that they had regular jobs, W-2 wage earners, and still claimed their real estate professional status meaning they were saying that they spent more time in real estate than they spent on being a W-2 wage earner. So if you have a W-2 and you also have rental property, you want to make sure that if you're taking the real estate professional status, that you have enough justification to substantiate that you spend more time in real estate. And remember, it's two rules. People usually think it's either or. In order for you to claim their real estate professional status, you need to spend at least 750 hours a year, which is about 14 hours a week, and not or, 750 hours and more time in real estate than in any other active profession. So if you don't meet those two requirements, you are not a real estate professional, and you might be limited in terms of the rental losses that you could claim. So I usually have my clients go through and fill out a real estate activity log and a mileage log to help you see. And just because you're full-time at work doesn't mean you're working 40 hours. And, you know, the joke, my boss, when I used to work um, at Marriott, my boss always made this joke, hey, Ben, I hired you to be available. I didn't hire you to work. You know, um, when he sees me when I'm doing something or taking a break, he's like, that's okay. I'm hiring, hiring you to be available. So it's possible that you are available 40 hours, but you're actually not putting in 40 hours. And so if you can establish that your work week is actually 30 hours or 25 hours rather than 40 hours, and you spend more time in real estate than in any other active profession, then you can choose a real estate professional status. But that's not something that you want to choose blindly. And then if you're a Schedule C filer, this is very important. Schedule C, which means that you're a single member LLC or you're a sole proprietor, Single member LLCs and sole proprietors file Schedule Cs, and you are 
much more likely to get audited than a multi-member LLC or an S Corp or a C Corp. So when you're filing a Schedule C, just know that you are raising an audit trigger, especially if you're reporting losses year after year. After three years, if you're reporting losses three out of five years, the IRS could um, establish that your business is not a business, is not a valid business, and it's a hobby. And those are the kind of things that will tr um, trigger an audit. Um, deducting mileage without a mileage log, this is very important. A lot of people, especially investors, you know, when you go to take a look at a property or you're making offers or you're showing your property for sale, you incur a lot of mileage. But if you're not um, maintaining a mileage log that you can submit if an audit comes up, that mileage will be, will be disallowed. So we have a mileage log. You can also go out and buy a mileage book um, that you could use, and with that, you're able to claim the mileage on the tax return. And um, I've already talked about number seven, um, using the real estate professional status when working full time. Um, and one of the things that we talk about um, that the IRS biggest weapon is fear. Um, so it shouldn't stop you from taking a legally aggressive position to save more money, but you should be aware that the IRS would use fear to intimidate you. And so two walls of defense that you can set up in order to eliminate fear of the IRS is audit prevention, and then another wall of defense and automatic pre-audit pre preparation. What does it mean to have audit preven prevention? I keep saying prevention, audit prevention or audit proven. That means to reduce your chances or even eliminate the chances of your return being selected for audit. And what do I mean? If you're a Schedule C filer, consider becoming a multi-member LLC. You know, if you have several rental properties, consider putting them in, a, in an LLC and file a partnership right tax return rather than filing a Schedule E or filing a Schedule C. If you have education expenses and you're going to boot camps, consider amortizing those costs rather than deducting it up front one time. And so that, those are things that we consider audit prevention, taking steps so that you're not even audited in the first place. And I've also gotten questions that will file in an extension not get you audited. Not necessarily, but the reason why I am in favor of filing extensions is because your CPA or your accountant will have more time to spend on your return than they usually will during the three months. We prepare 80% or 90% of returns between January and April. So you can imagine if you're one of those people, um, the, the, your CPA is typically not spending as much time as they could after tax season, and you have all the way from May to October. When I was working um, in the corporate tax department and working for one of the largest real estate investors, we never, ever, ever filed a return April 15th. Everything was automatically extended because you got six months to file an accurate return to find any missed deductions. So if you're an investor, um, audit prevention could also mean an audit, I'll call this audit proofing. It's filing extension so that your accountant has more time to spend on your return than they normally would during tax season. And then in case you're audited, you definitely want to look at um, automatic pre-audit preparation meaning that you are able to substantiate every item on your tax return. You know, we just talked about the mileage log. We talked about the real estate activity log, you know, having um, good superior bookkeeping. So being able to defend your case if an IRS audit does come up. And you don't want to wait until you get that letter saying that you're audited. You want to do it during tax time and file it away so that if you get audited, you can just pull out that file. Because typically the IRS, if they're auditing, they're auditing two to three years after you file a return. So this year, 2012, they're probably looking at 2009 tax return. Well, if you didn't keep good records, can you imagine having to go back to try to reconstruct your return um, at this point? Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about is, you know, reduce your chances of an audit. You know, filing extensions, we've already talked about that. Avoid Schedule C's and Schedule E's. File a partnership tax return. And being conservative about your taxes does not necessarily mean that, oh, you can um, reduce your chances on the audit. But it's good to be creative. It's good to be aggressive. 
And at the same time, it does not necessarily mean that that exposes you to an audit. And if you do get audited, being able to substantiate um, the audit, you know, helps a lot. Um, if you do get audited, I want you to know that you have rights and um, that you are always welcome to appeal an audit. As a, as a taxpayer, you have rights when dealing with the IRS. Don't just assume that you know, when the IRS auditor makes all these adjustments, that that means that you just have to sign, accept it, and go because you're afraid. No, you have the right to contest it, and I'm hoping that I'm going to have one or two of my clients on the line um, tonight who have been audited, and, you know, they came to me after the first round of audit with the auditor, and I told them that we will be um, filing um, for an appeal. And, you know, by actually going through the appeal, we were able to win the audit. So it's, I'm encouraging you that just because you get audited that doesn't mean that um, it's over. Um, just know that you can appeal even if the IRS auditor does not agree with your changes. All right, so the next thing is, you know, you can appeal. And most of the time I've noticed that the appeal examiner is a lot more flexible than the um, IRS auditors themselves. So it's, you know, with the audits that I've gone through, we've usually just gone to appeal because you're trying to um, talk to the auditor and they're not understanding and they have certain quotas that they need to reach. So if you know you're right, it gives you more confidence. Um, you know, like I said, let's not even get to the point of getting audited. But if you do get to the point of getting audited, know your rights um, from the onset and know what it is that you can do. Um, I just wanted to talk about different IRS court cases that have featured um, real estate investors. And Harnett versus Commissioner, um, in this case, the taxpayer owned several properties and he failed to meet the 750-hour test and did not qualify as a real estate professional because he could not prove the hours test was met with detailed logs and the court did not find his testimony credible. So this is very important that it's possible for you to own 10, 20 properties and you're spending more time managing those properties than you're spending on your, uh, your regular job. But if you're, if you're not able to substantiate that, you're, you're not going to be qualified as a real estate professional. So it's very important that you keep very good records and that you're able to prove that you spend a lot of hours, you know, make sure you have a diary where you're keeping log, you're, you know, you're scheduling appointments, you're using emails, everything that shows that you're constantly working on these properties more than you are at your job. And then for Tom and Nancy Miller, um, in, a, in their case, um, the, it was established that Mr. Miller, although he had a full-time job um, with a tugboat company, he was classified as a real estate professional. And why did he win this case? He had documentation and was able to show his real estate activity law. So we see that in both cases, it was an issue of being a real estate professional. One person won because they were able to substantiate their claim. And the other, um, the other taxpayer did not win because they could not prove their hours tax. And then the last case, um, same thing, they were not able to prove the necessary 750 hours on their real estate business due to lack of appropriate documentation. As a result, they were disallowed the deduction. And what this means, if you're disallowed a deduction on your tax return, it means that losses that you otherwise claim are no longer um, acceptable. All right, it looks like this thing took me. All right, so one of the things that we're going to be looking at is these are actual wealth building CPA clients that went through an audit. I'm looking through to see if I have um, any of my clients on the line. I asked about two of them to join us this evening so that they could tell us um, exactly what their experience was going through the audit. Um, I don't see any of them on yet, but if they come on, I will give them a chance um, to say something. Um, so the first one is um, a client that was being audited because they purchased 10 investment properties in one year. So after our representation, they went from owing $34,000 to getting a refund of $17,000.
because they forgot to take deductions for advertising expense that they had on the American Express card. So this actually worked out in their favor, where they went from home and to actually get in a refund. Um, this next client um, is a Pennsylvania client and was filing a single return, was being audited because they purchased a rental property and also started a real estate business. And they purchased this property with their sister and subsequently sold the property in 2009. Well, believe it or not, the IRS disallowed a deduction um, on their 2006 return because they believe that they did not legit legitimately own this um, rental property with their sister, but we're able to establish that. But the other biggest thing that really awed me was that the former CPA forgot to write off the property when the property was sold in 2009 and also did not take any depreciation over the years. So as a result of us going to appeal, and this was something that just happened about three months, two, three months ago, as a result of, um, of going through appeal, you know, she had gone through the auditor, they made the adjustments, and she came to me when um, the IRS auditor was going to close the case, and I told him we want to go to appeal. And we went to appeal, and the appeals examiner took into income the refi proceeds. We were able to calculate the loss that she had on the rental property. At the end of the day, she went from owing $29,000 to just $2,000. So this was, you know, this was a very big win. And then this last case, this just happened about last week. Um, this is actually um, Alex Cruxton, and she's the one that's supposed that's going to be joining us um, sometime on the call this evening. Um, she was being audited because she did not pick up a 1099C cancellation of that income. Um, there were some properties that she got rid of and got a 1099C. The IRS auditor... Um, not only included this cancellation of that income, but recalculated her gain based on the depreciation allowable and not necessarily depreciation taken. This is very important. If you don't take depreciation that you're supposed to take or that you were allowed to take, if the IRS calculates your loss or your gain, they'll calculate it on depreciation allowable versus depreciation taken. So it's very important that you are taking the depreciation that you need to take on your rental property. Well, I wrote here because, like I said, um, we came up with these slides before we got the letter last week. We're appealing this because they failed to take into account all the rehab and improvement expenses um, that were not reflected on the hard one, as well as the difference between the depreciation taken and the depreciation allowable. Um, you know, like I said here, that this case is still in appeal, but we submitted a change requesting an adjustment of our taxable income to a decrease. So, well, I'm happy to report that we got a letter last week from the appeals examiner. He agreed with our changes, and he's actually going to decrease our taxable income by that amount. And that actually means that for this audit, she's going from owing about $40,000 to getting a $10,000 refund. So this was, you know, definitely a great um, case. Um, for me. And now don't forget that, you know, when you become a member of the Wealth Building Program, we do an initial consultation, sit down with you and figure out where you are right now and where you need to be. And then together we come up with a personalized Wealth Building Program. So at this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to um, Steve. So Steve, you can take it away and let me know when to change the slides. If you have any questions, please feel free to type it up in the chat box. And um, once Steve is done with his presentation, we will open up the line um, for questions. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, thanks, Avery. Um So I'm going to be talking tonight about the benefits of investing in commercial real estate. So it, it's, uh, commercial real estate is a little bit different than some of the other things you might think of. Uh, for those of you who've been through the past few years and you've watched your home prices decrease in value and you're hearing all the, uh, the doom and gloom about a real estate bubble, what I want to talk to you about is a different kind of real estate, not, not investing in single family homes and hoping the price goes up, which a lot of people do and a lot of people lost money at, but investing in money that, in, in, in uh, commercial properties that, that actually pay you every month in rents. Uh, the pictures you see here are from uh, an apartment complex that I own in St. Petersburg, Florida. I've always loved that fountain, so I tend to put this on my slide because I think it's really a, a very attractive uh, complex. 
It's um, six blocks from the pier in St. Petersburg, and it's a walking distance to all the downtown areas and, and biking distance to the university. So it's a, a great location and a, and a nice complex. Uh, this complex itself brings in around $8,500 a month in rents. And uh, in a, that's money that comes in every month. So it's the kind of thing that you can actually uh, build wealth off of because you're getting something that's very steady. So I'm going to talk about commercial real estate and why you want to go into that. There's really four ways that you make money in commercial real estate. Uh, but before I go into too much detail on that, I want to talk about why now for commercial real estate. Uh, you've heard all the doom and gloom. You've heard the real estate bubble. You've heard that prices are gone. You've heard that there's no more loans. Well, a lot of that is true, and a lot of that has affected people's attitudes. So suppose you have a property that pays $10,000 a month from rents. And that property was priced at you know a million dollars, and now because of the commercial bubble and all the doom and gloom, it's now priced at seven hundred thousand dollars. But it still makes ten thousand dollars every month. You're going to be doing a whole lot better buying it at seven hundred thousand than at a million because you make the same return you would have made if you paid a million. So that's in a nutshell why commercial real estate is such a good opportunity right now. Prices are depressed, but the rents are still up. <laughs> So how do you make money in commercial real estate? Uh, the first and, and the main piece is the cash flow. Uh, apartment complexes, if you have 100 units and you have 90 of them occupied, you're getting rents from those tenants every month, 90 rents. And that adds up over time. It pays the mortgage. It pays, it pays off the property for you at some point. And it, it just uh, is a very, very steady income because it's every month that comes in. Uh, the other way you make money with all kinds of real estate is when you have appreciation and the price of the property goes up. So with commercial real estate, though, the value of the property depends on two things. One of those, are, one of those is market forces, like with other real estate, and the other one is income. So you can actually force the value of a commercial property to go up by increasing the income. And that's something you can't do as easily with, say, a single family home. Uh, the third thing, and I, I know a Barry can talk about this at length, are the tax advantages of real estate. So she's talked about taking depreciation on properties and how that can make a huge difference in the amount of taxable income that you have. So tax advantages are very important, and those are especially important for commercial real estate, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, the other big tax advantage from real estate is that even if you make a whole bunch of money by selling real estate that goes up in value, if you buy more real estate, you can defer those taxes to later. Now, I am not an accountant, and I do not give accounting advice, so if you have questions about those sorts of things and the tax advantages, those really should go to a bearing. But it's very important to, to know that these are there, because you can often, if you buy correctly, depreciate away almost all of your income on, on real estate. Uh, when you have something large like a, uh, a commercial apartment building, you can do what's something called cost segregation, and that essentially expands the depreciation that you're allowed to take. It does it by dividing up the, uh, how the property is viewed for depreciation. So any particular commercial property is going to have stuff that can be considered personal property and other stuff that are, are, are improvements, other stuff that's land, and how you divide that up uh, makes a difference in how you do depreciation. So what I have found in, in my experience, and, and you know, uh, uh, other people can correct me if I'm wrong, that, that about 10 to 15 percent of an apartment complex often ends up being personal property, which is depreciated over five years instead of uh, you know, improvements that are depreciated over 27 and a half or 39 years. So there's some real advantages there that can speed up your depreciation and, and really uh, allow you to take advantage of those tax advantages. And the last piece for commercial real estate is unlike with stocks, typically if you buy a stock and you want to buy $100 worth of stock, you pay $100. With real estate, you can typically buy property with 10 to 30 percent down. These days it's closer to the 30 percent. But you can get properties, actually, now with 10% down. There are some uh, special small business programs where you can buy property with 10% down. But you make 
your returns apply to the whole property. So if we look at a, a kind of a very quick uh, investment comparison here. So your traditional investments, I'm looking at CDs, stocks, bonds, real estate flips, which is what people think of as buying it, buying low and selling high. Um, and then uh, that would include rehab projects, where you buy a property, you fix it up, and then you sell it. And then I'm going to talk about commercial real estate either coming in as, as, as debt or equity, and I'll explain what those mean in just a moment. Um, so with the traditional investment, CDs right now, I think actually 1% to 2% is, is somewhat generous. Uh, those, those rates are very low. Uh, bank interest rates are even lower. They're fractions of a percent. Uh, bonds, I have the average return there is around 4%. Uh, the risk is pretty low for bonds, as long as you buy a company that doesn't go out of business, and as long as you want to hold it for the life of the bond. Um, stocks, I have actually here the average return of 10%, uh, but I, I did some checking, and over the past 15 years, stocks have returned an average of 5 and 3 quarter percent, not 10%. And as we all know, the stock market goes up and it goes down, and sometimes it can do that very rapidly. So there's, there's quite a lot of volatility in stocks. Real estate flips are very, very market driven. Now you can get quite a good return buying, rehabbing, and selling. Uh, most of the people that I know are actually making in excess of 25% as their return on investment. Uh, and the risk is medium but requires a lot of expertise. Commercial real estate debt, if you loan money on commercial asset, so you as an investor make a loan to the person who owns the commercial property, and that loan is secured by the commercial property. So you're just like a bank. Uh, you can make returns anywhere from 6 to 18%. 18% is more like hard money. 6% is more of a longer term type of debt situation. And your risk there, as long as you uh, the commercial property is, is the right kind of property, is very low because the, the property itself pays yeah, the mortgage, as opposed to the, the person you're loaning it to. Uh, real, commercial real estate equity. This is where you buy part ownership in a property. And we see returns from 8 to 50%. And in fact, um, you know, we've seen returns in triple digits on some properties. Um, I call the risk low there only in comparison with some of these other things. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go in and tell you that, that if the, if the SEC talks to you, the only thing that is actually low risk are treasury bonds. So all these things should be compared with treasury bonds, with treasury bonds as much, much lower risk than all of these others. Uh, so what should you, what should be your considerations when you want to invest in commercial properties? What we do when we invest in properties, and that's that is one of the things that I do is I am I'm a what they call a syndicator and so I I bring investors together and I allow people with not as much money to come together and buy a much bigger property with more stable uh, more stable rates and more stable cash flow I pull that together using something called a uh, a private placement uh, which is under the regulation D of the Securities and Exchange Commission. So it's called a Reg D offering, it's called a private placement, and it's called a syndication. Those are all sort of the same thing. So when I put together projects, um, I look for properties that have existing cash flow. And some people buy vacant properties and then fill them up. But I look for something that already has a cash flow. So don't worry about this cap rate. The cap rate is, is essentially a price to earnings ratio in stocks. It's sort of the same thing. So it, it, it's a measure of, uh, of how much the property would make if you paid all cash. Okay. I also look for greater than 20 units because I prefer to invest in uh, apartment buildings, um, mobile home parks, and self-storage. Uh, in this particular market, I find that those are more stable than office or retail. I look for properties that have a substantial upside, meaning I, I, I have a way to increase the rents, and so I can increase the value of the property. I can force it to go up in value. And I do that by filling vacancies. So I look prop for properties that are maybe 60 to 80 percent filled as opposed to 90 to 100 percent filled. And I can do it by improving the property so I can raise the rents. Uh, the other things that I look for in a property is uh, a good way to buy. We talked earlier that leverage is very important. 
if you can get a bank loan at 4 or 5% on a property that's returning 8%, well, now you get what we call positive leverage. You're making money off of the bank's money. And so if I can find either existing financing that, that comes in, in, in low and, and is very, very easy to deal with, or if there's some new financing that someone's offering, say seller financing, for example, there are a lot of ways to come in and, uh, and really get some good leverage on the property so that you can increase your return. And so my target, uh, when I look at a property, is for the cash that my investors and I are investing, I want to see 20% cash on cash. So that's 20% that's re return from the rents. That doesn't count appreciation, and I typically don't count depreciation in there because I'm not always sure I'm going to take it because some investors prefer to invest with a retirement account. So let me give you some examples of some actual properties that we've done some analysis on. And I, I apologize, these numbers are kind of small, um, but I'll try to talk through the, uh, the core parts of this deal. This is a, an apartment complex called the Inn at Greensboro College. It's 61 apartments that's used as student housing. So Greensboro College owned the property, and their plan was to sell it to someone like us, and to lease it back for five years on a master lease. So imagine you have your property 100% leased for five years, and the college will pay all expenses except taxes. So they're going to do all the maintenance, they're going to do all the insurance, and they're going to do um, <coughs> everything except taxes. And in fact, when I was proposing uh, uh, this to them, they, they offered to pay taxes too, but I thought I could get the taxes decreased. And I would rather pay those and get the savings myself. So uh, there's also always a chance the college would renew that lease after five years as well. So without going into all the numbers in this chart, if someone were loaning money against this property, it would be very easy to pay an 8% mortgage. So someone providing a mortgage to this to, to, to cover the purchase price or to cover the down payment for the purchase price could easily be paid 8%. So if someone wanted to loan, invest money at 8%, paid, say, monthly or quarterly every year for the next five years, that's really a pretty stable, non-volatile investment. The other thing that uh, an investor could do is take 50% ownership. So now they're going to own, they're going to get the leverage, they'll get the depreciation, they'll get a whole bunch of the investment opportunities there. And there, instead of 8%, According to these projections, you would have made around 9 to 12 percent just from the cash flow. So you would get additional savings from your depreciation. And uh, so this would be uh, a more uh, profitable way to participate in the property. But you do now have the responsibility and the liability for the property as the part owner of it. So you have the, all, the, all the burdens of ownership as well. So you know, if something goes horribly wrong and you haven't covered yourself right, which you need to do, then, you know, the place burns down, there's issues. Okay. Uh, the next example is a self-storage property. Self-storage I really like because um, there's no toilets. Uh, unless you have climate control, there's no air conditioning. It's very bare-bones properties with limited maintenance, and you, you never see your tenants. Um, you give them, you know, their own codes to the gates, so you more or less, you know, put their checks out there and make sure the property is still there in the morning. So this was a very well-located self-storage facility, 461 units in uh, outskirts of Kansas City, uh, Missouri. Uh, it was currently 68% occupied, but it really should be 90% occupied if the management were doing all this job that it should have been doing. Uh, expenses were well above average. I believe the expenses on this were around 50%. And that was largely due to the owners kind of sucking money out and calling them management expenses. But the 35% uh, the, the average, that's the average expense ratio for self-storage properties, is, uh, is something that you can look at as a ballpark to understand where you should be with these. Uh, this had highway visibility, and it was brand near a brand new medical center. So there's very good locations there. And medical centers have a lot of uh, requirements for storage because the doctors have to store their records. So if you can have uh, storage facilities that are what we call HIPAA, 
client, um, you can uh, you can make a lot of money from uh, those doctor storage records. So it's pretty hard to read the numbers, and I don't, don't want to make you do that. But in these projections, there was a big increase in return from the second year when we got the vacant units leased up. So we got it up from 68% occupied up closer to 80-90% occupied. And so a projected investor return, if you invest in equity, goes from around 13% to around 31%. So these are real properties, and these, these are projections based on, on, on market rates there. And it gives you some sense of the kinds of projects that are available out there in commercial real estate. So uh, it, you really should consider that uh, as, as a part of your portfolio, along with your stocks and your bonds and your other investments. Uh, you can invest in commercial real estate from an IRA, uh, either a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA. Obviously, the depreciation doesn't help you out much there. Uh, but all the other things, the cash flow and the appreciation, this can be a very long-term wealth-building strategy. Uh, and you can have your returns build faster without being taxed uh, if you have it in a, a tax-deferred account. So in a nutshell, that's commercial real estate. And uh, Barry, uh, let me turn that back over to you for a moment, and we can either uh, go to questions or you can finish off the other things that you wanted to do. Yes, thanks a lot, um, Steve. That was very informative, and I can already see a lot of questions um, coming up on the question box. And, you know, this is really what we call wealth building, um, and that's why we're the wealth building CPA. We look at all aspects of wealth building. So in this one call, you've been able to hear on one hand how to avoid the IRS, and on the other hand how to build your wealth. And can you imagine if you merge um, the two together? Um, I'm not tech savvy. I do have my clients on the call, so I'm going to try to see if I can unmute this to have them speak for a couple of minutes. And if we're not able to get it, we'll just move on. Um, so let me just give me about a second here. Let me see if we can try that out. And if you have any questions, I see um, a lot of questions coming through the um, chat um, question box. Keep um, typing out the questions. We will try to answer all the questions um, this evening. All right, I have tried that, and I am not able to get through. See if you have any ideas there. They're not logged in on the computer. They're just on the phone so they can hear us, but there's no way for me to unmute. Forgive me, I'm a CPA, not a techie person. <laughs> all right, so we'll just move on. Um, all right, so I have a couple of questions here that we will um, go ahead and ask. Um, this question is currently I'm full-time in real estate and charge miles used when driving. Can I buy or lease a vehicle in the firm without raising flags with the IRS? Um, usually I tell um, my clients that even if you were to buy a, a vehicle or any property in the name of the business, that does not necessarily make it a business expense. You know, usually the question for a business expense, is it ordinary and is it necessary? So even if you did purchase a property or a car or a computer in the name of the business, you still will need to allocate the expense to the business based on business use. How often do you use it for business? So even if you... Um, you know, pay 100% of the cost through the business, but you're only using it 20%. You're only su supposed to deduct 20% of the cost. Um, so that, that's, you know, just kind of like a guide because a lot of people say, oh, if I buy, you know, if I buy something in the name of the business, that makes it 100% deductible. No, you would still need to answer the question whether it's ordinary and necessary for the business. And if you use it partly for personal use, then you're supposed to subtract the expenses that's allocated to personal use. Um, the other question is, which is better to document 750 hours per year as real estate professional or full-time job? Um, I think it's both. You can get the best of both worlds. It's possible to document the 750 hours and have the full-time job and still be considered a real estate professional. The truth is that we have a lot of 
these people, and I'm, I'm one of them that I love real estate. I own about 11 properties of my own. After tax season, I'm, I spend time doing a lot of real estate. So it's neither here nor there to say whether I'm a CPA or a real estate investor. So just, so just put me in one category without allowing the hours to prove that. You know, I think sometimes it's not, you know, it's not beneficial, and if it can be substantiated, I say absolutely. If you're able to substantiate that you're a real estate professional, even though you have a full-time job, I'll say go for it. Um, all right, there's a question here about putting up the website again. It gets taken down too fast. I apologize, um, Paul, about that. I'm not sure I understand what you mean. I don't know if you mean that we're scrolling by too um, quickly. Uh, please retype your question so I understand what you mean. I'm currently unemployed, seeking full-time employment. However, I own two single-family homes, currently rented with one-year leases. Um, okay, I don't see the rest of the question. All right, I don't see the rest of the question. And then, Steve, this is actually for you. Have you owned and managed such properties like the self-storage, for example, and what have been the results? All right, hold on, let me see. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve, it looks like I muted you. I'm sorry, are you back on? Uh, yeah, there I am. Um, uh, well, I have to own self-storage at this point, though so I just got under contract with a, um, a three-facility package for self-storage. Uh, but I do own two apartment complexes, one in Mississippi and one in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. Okay, and what have the results been for those? Uh, well, the one in, in St. Petersburg, uh, it took me about a year to get it really stabilized. Um, I had to uh, get the vacancies back up. Right now, I am, I'm full except for one down unit that I need to do some repairs on. And uh, I'm, I'm making money off of it on the uh, Mississippi property. Um, I've been making money on that pretty much. Uh, I think it took me about six months to get the vacancies down so that I was, I was doing well on that one. And I've been making money on that one as well. Great. And now this is a question from one of my newer wealth building CPA um, clients. Do you recommend that new investors attempt to get into commercial properties? Uh, it depends on what you're doing as the investors. If, if you're planning to do the whole thing yourself, to find the property, to manage the property, uh, you probably want to find someone to work with who has a little more experience. Um, if, uh, if you're looking to be a, a passive investor in it, uh, certainly you can do commercial properties the same way that you can do stocks or bonds or anything else. There are opportunities to invest without having to do the work yourself. Uh, doing the work yourself is always interesting too. There's a lot of things that you can learn how to do. Um, if you're if you're a new investor and you're really trying to learn how to do the real estate investments, I think I would probably have you do something on the on the residential side first. I think that's what most people do, and that's pretty common. But if you're talking about trying to place funds and and get in either as a private lender or in, into commercial real estate or working with uh, uh, some experienced professionals, I, I think you can do that as a new investor. Yeah, and my, my um, comment and real estate, actually, um, Steve and I belong to the same real estate club, and one of the um, banners that we have there is crawl, walk, run. So it's just like a baby, you know, would you ask a baby to chew meat from the time that they're born? And the answer is no. You want to start them out with milk? And then you add the cereal, and then you add the uh, mashed foods, and then eventually they can go to eat regular food. So for a new investor, while it may look very appealing, and I'm not saying it cannot be done, there's usually exceptions to the rule, we usually suggest that you start, you know, by crawling, you know, get a single family home first, get experience with that, and then move on as you go along. You know, this is steady wealth. This is retirement wealth. This is wealth building. So, you know, Rome is not built in a day. You take it one step at a time. Now, there are people who feel that they're ready to jump right in. You're more than welcome to do that. But if I were to advise them, like Steve said correctly, I would say that you should crawl first, then walk, 
than a run. And, and if right, I can add one, one, one thing, just that, that uh, uh, whatever you do, it, it should be in support of whatever your investment goals are. I mean, commercial real estate investing or any kind of real estate investing, it, it should be in, in, in support of what you're trying to do and sort of part of your plan and not just, you know, hey, this looks like a good investment. Exactly. And um, the next question that we have is, um, okay, rephrasing the question, somebody that's currently unemployed with two single-family homes, one-year leases, will you suggest establishing an LLC? Usually, um, why do we establish LLCs? We establish LLCs for asset protection. And so there has to be an asset that we're protected, either personally or um, in the business. So on the personal side, do you have any chances of exposing yourself to legal liability? And if the answer is yes, then you definitely don't want a situation where somebody could decide to sue you and then they have access to the properties, especially now that you're unemployed. This might be the only assets that you own. And then the second question is, does the LLC, will the LLC have any assets to protect if you were to put it? Meaning, does it have any equity? What kind of equity do these single-family um, homes own? So usually what I do is 90% loan to value. If you calculate 90% of the value of the home and um, take 10% towards closing costs and then back out what you owe on the loan, if you still have equity there that's more than $30,000, then yes, I would say that you should put it in an LLC. However, if you don't have that much equity or it's upside down, putting it in an LLC is really not going to do anything because there's no asset to protect. Now, I'm glad that you brought up this question because when you're thinking about asset protection, we usually worry about one type of creditor, the bottom-up creditor. But most of us investors don't realize that we also have the top-down creditor. With the bottom-up creditor, that creditor is coming after you personally. And so putting the property in an LLC limits whatever personal exposure you may have. But there's also the top-down creditor, a creditor that can come after the asset, the LLC itself. And so while you may have protected yourself from personal liability, you may not have protected the LLC if there's an equity. If there's an LLC that has equity of 100000 and somebody decides to sue the LLC or to sue the property, you still, you still haven't done asset protection. So just keep in mind that asset protection needs to do both, protect you from the bottom-up creditor and from the top-down creditor. All right. Um, I try to write down the wealth building website that was given at the end of Avera's presentation, but couldn't write fast enough. I am so sorry. All right. Let me see if I can get back here to the um, contacts. So I have the um, website currently up, and our phone number is the wealthbuildingcpa.com or wealthbuildingcpa.com. Either one of those um, contacts. And our phone number is 1-888-502-3767, 1-888-502-3767. So if you'd like to contact us, we definitely um, offer initial phone consultations, and they're free. And Steve, please go ahead and give out your number as well. Uh, sure, Barry. You can reach me at 301-332-3750. And you can also reach me by email. Um, I think that very last slide has my contact information, but I'll, I'll say it out as well. It's Steve, S-T-E-V-E, -E, at Street Smart Investments with an S, LLC dot com. So it's Street Smart Investments, LLC dot com. And uh, you, know, you guys can see it's a play on my name, Steve Streetman, Street Smart Investments. So. All right, thanks, Steve. We have a couple of more questions as we wind down here. Okay, the, the other question about the single-family home, there is an equity of 150000 Absolutely, you need to protect that, um, that the two single-family homes. You do need to contact me so that we can talk because putting it in an LLC does not necessarily protect the asset. It protects you. Um, from any kind of personal liability arising out of the property or anybody coming after you can't come after the property, but it does not protect that equity. So you need two strategies 
on how to protect that equity. So please give me a call so we can discuss that off the line. Um, another question is, can a personal LLC use LLC funds and also qualified IRA funds from my self-directed IRA to make an investment in real estate? Can I set this up so that I'm not self-dealing? So I think, Steve, this might be your question, but let me make sure I understand it. Can a personal LLC use LLC funds and also qualified IRA funds to make investment? The answer is yes. But from what I've understood from the custodians and the trustees, it needs to happen simultaneously. It needs to happen at the same time. It cannot happen after one has invested and then the other one is paying up whatever. So you can't invest with all personal LLC funds and then turn around and use your IRA funds to pay up whatever the personal LLC. Both the personal LLC and the IRA LLC would need to invest into their real estate at the same time on the same day. Other than, other than that, it will be considered self-dealing. Um, Steve, I don't know if you have any comments about that. Um, actually, I do. If, think about it as a, if you're investing in a company. Um, you can buy Microsoft stock in your in your uh, uh, in your IRA, and you can buy Microsoft stock outside of your IRA if you wanted to, and that would not be self-dealing, right? You can be, both both your regular money and your IRA money can invest in Microsoft, and the reason is because there are other people involved in it. So, as I understand it, and again. Uh, uh, this is the kind of thing that you really want to go to someone like a Barry, and she can research the question for you. Um, I think if you if you and your uh, LLC invest in a company where there are other people who also have ownership, which is like a Microsoft, only only smaller, then you can invest from both sides. But I think you have to be really really careful. I, I, I don't think there's any way to do it unless you have other people involved. Yeah, and I also know that it has to be done at the same time. So it's not something that you can start out with your personal LLC and then have your IRA come in later. They both need to be invested in that LLC, let's say it's another LLC with other people or in that property at the same time. Um, another question here is, can you syndicate the depreciation if you use your Roth IRA? And I think the answer is no. Unfortunately, um, even though you have access to depreciation, investing through your um, self-directed IRA would limit your ability to use that depreciation anywhere else. Because the IRA um, does not file any taxes, you will not, you cannot use that depreciation. However, um, please, this is very important. If you use um, self-directed IRA um, to invest in real estate, and you had a debt finance, meaning you have to take out a mortgage to purchase the property. You are required to file an unrelated business income tax return for the portion of the income that's related to the debt or to the mortgage that you purchase. In that case, you can use the depreciation to reduce the income, but it's still a completely separate tax return. It's a Form 1041 that is filed. It does not go anywhere on your individual tax return. So if you want to take, have access to depreciation, you can only use that depreciation to reduce net income if you have to calculate your unrelated business taxable income. Um, can expenses incurred in a previous tax year while the rental property, while the rental properties and there was not income at all be deducted or carried to the following tax year when the properties rehab that finally rented and sold. Absolutely. Actually, the rule is once the property is done being rehabbed and you now place it in service, whether or not it's rented, you can start taking deductions at that point. So if you bought a property January of 2011 and you rehabbed it up till August and you did not rent it out till January of 2012, whatever expenses you had from August of 2011, to December of 2011, you can deduct because the property has been placed in service, whether or not it's being rented. But any expenses that you incur from January when you purchase the property to August when you finish rehabbing will be added to the cost basis of the property. All right, we're going to take one or two more questions and then we start winding down. How can several investors working together in a long-term joint venture so that all are protected and each can report on their own um, LLC. 
Well, I'll allow Steve to share that. I do have my ideas, but Steve, this is something that Steve does um, on a regular basis. I bring in people together. So he can answer it, and then I'll also answer that from a tax perspective. But I'll let Steve answer it from a real estate perspective, which is how can several investors um, work together in a long-term joint venture so that all are protected and each can report on their own LLC? Okay, that's actually uh, very easy. Um, when you do a syndication or a private placement, you essentially set up an LLC that, say, owns the property. But now that LLC, that LLC is owned by the investors, but the investors can own it through their own LLC. So let's say investor A has LLC number one, and investor B has LLC number two, and investor C has LLC, LLC number three. Well, now you have an LLC that's owned by LLC number one, LLC number two, and LLC number three, and that other LLC owns the property. So they're all protected from the bottom-up creditor because of the limited liability of the LLC that they, all three of them own. And to some extent, they're, they're protected from the top-down creditors because both they have the LLC that they own themselves, and then the second LLC, which is owned by the original LLC. So it, it gets a little complicated, but really this is done all the time. It's very common for people to participate in a syndication as an LLC. Uh, it, it's, it's really done all the time. Yeah, and I know I've also had clients who felt that, you know, they naturally didn't want to go form a new LLC um, and just wanted to do a joint venture um, since they already have their own LLC. I mean, that's fine, but it really doesn't give you the kind of asset protection um, that you need in the long run. So I'll say that the cost of forming a new LLC that all the other LLCs plug into is far less than the exposure of just doing it as a joint venture. Um, all right, we have one last comment. Oh, thank you both speakers. This is an excellent webinar. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, like I said, we're going to try to bring as much of these webinars to you once every month. If you have any topic that you want us to cover, anything that you want us to discuss, um, like I said, this is not a pitching webinar. We're not here to sell anything. We're here to give you pure information. And our goal is that with the information that you get from us, um, you can use that to build your wealth. Again, my contact information is one 502 502-3767, or you can go to our website at wealthbuildingcpa.com, or you can send an email to info at wealthbuildingcpa.com. I'll allow Steve um, to go ahead and give out his contact information again. Uh, yeah, and I'm Steve Streetman, S-T-R-E-E-T-M-A-N. My number is 301-332-3750. Uh, you can also go to our website, www.streetsmartinvestmentsllc.com, or you can send an email to me, steve at streetsmartinvestmentsllc.com. Uh, thank you all for listening, and, and Barry, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. This is a, a topic I, I'm uh, very passionate about, and it's always nice to, to get a chance to share some information with people. Absolutely, and I have one last comment here from Margarita. Thank you. This really warms my heart. She said, what a feeling of support. I'm glad you're not selling anything. And that's, that's really what the Wealth Building CPA is about. We, you know, we've seen a lot of um, people, you know, you go to boot camps and training upon training, and it's one selling after the other. And at the end of the day, you haven't invested. Steve is an investor. He has commercial properties. Um, to back up what he says, I am an investor. I invest in single-family residences, and I'm working with Steve to get into commercial. So I'm speaking from a point of an investor and a CPA. I'm not a speaker. I'm only speaking because it enables me to provide information that I have. Same thing with Steve. Steve is not a speaker. He only speaks because it enables him to provide information that he has on commercial investing. And our goal is not to sell. We know that if we do things right, that the clients will come and the business will come. So God bless everyone. Have a great evening. Um, and if you want to listen to this webinar, we are going to have it on replay um, maybe in the next couple of days. And please feel free to contact either one of us if you have any more questions. Um, have a great evening.